Hey guys, and welcome back. So, today I am going to do something different. Today, um, I am going to try to explain some historiography, but because of the sensitivity of the topic and how much it's still in the news, how much we really do need to be better about understanding the consequences of the time period that I'm about to talk about, and encourage people to actually read some of these authors that I am going to mention, because a lot of these people are still probably some of the most important people in their field, especially a particular one. And we need to actually grasp what they're saying. Today, we are talking about Reconstruction. Or more specifically, Reconstruction of the South after the Civil War. So, Reconstruction is complicated because it's an action, it's an event... And it was a plan that started before the end of the Civil War. More specifically, it was a plan kind of drawn up by Lincoln in 1863 about what readmittance of the southern states were going to look like, especially as the war went on. The war that got started about slavery, more specifically the expansion of slavery into new territories. Um, what started out as Southern fear became a reality as, as uh, Lincoln's view of preserving the Union really had to include, by 1862-1863, a firm plan to end slavery, and readmit the southern states. This, and because it became more politically important as the war went on, especially as Georgia went up in flames, uh, Sherman entered South Carolina, it looked like um, the retaking of Vir Virginia was going to happen. The Mississippi, w the Mississippi was taken. All these made the question of Reconstruction a lot more important. Now, Lincoln had a plan that it was basically going to be a fairly light reconstruction, but with his death and whatever Lincoln's plan was going to be, died with Lincoln. Then we had Johnson, his vice president, who more or less seemed to really wanted Southern leaders to grovel first, then put them back in their position. Which, when you consider how many of these were Confederate leaders that Johnson was kind of hand-waving away their trees after a bit of groveling, left Grant, Sherman, and most of the radical Republicans in Congress with a bad taste in their mouth. Which leads to Congress taking over Reconstruction, and and especially as Johnson was trying to mess with the War Department, as they were, as the South was basically under a military occupation, Congress tried to redefine war power so that they had more power over it in this question of who was in charge of the military led to an attempt at impeachment against Johnson that didn't really go anywhere. Like, it was close, but everyone kind of knew that this was really a debate over 
Congress having any say in war powers. So with Congress basically taking over Reconstruction, and as Grant became the next president, putting down Southern insurgencies and actually enforcing the 13th, 14th, and 15th, and eventually the 15th Amendment, aka the Civil Rights Amendments, of, of ending slavery in as many forms as they could spell out, with a big exception being over... over prisons, which unfortunately does get exploited, and apprenticeships, then you, which, again, both these kind of actually really have a big, important shadow over our politics today. And then you have 14th Amendment, which spells out our modern definition of what it means to be a U.S. citizen. And then you have the 15th Amendment, which spells out voting rights. So, why, if all this is happening, why do we have a bad memory of Reconstruction? Well, a lot of that has to do with the Grant presidency itself. Grant himself wasn't exactly... He didn't always have the best luck in who to trust. For instance, one, probably one, the two people in his life that actually did care about him and didn't want to exploit him was one, his wife, and two, General Rowland, who basically spent most of the Civil War trying to ensure that Grant's and what all likelihood was probably a severe case of depression anxiety, didn't wreck himself or fall into any large amounts of drinking or any self-destructive behavior. He basically was there to, in all but name, be Grant's therapist and moral compass. And uh, this loyalty and friendship to Grant carried Roland to actually be part of Grant's cabinet, but he died pretty soon in once appointed. So without Roland, Grant kind of surrounded himself with a bunch of corrupt people who basically spelt the end of any chance of Grant being remembered favorably, even though Grant crushed a lot of the Southern insurgencies. He actually did try to enforce enforce the ideals of actually ensuring that freed men would be on would actually have a chance to rise up from where they were at before or even immediately after the Civil War. Unfortunately, um we need to remember that before the Civil War, um, most Americans in the North were anti-slavery, which meant they didn't want the expansion of slavery, but the people who wanted slavery to end abolitionists were a minority. While most of the North did eventually come around to the idea of ending slavery, it... What in their mind that meant, even amongst original abolitionists, varied. Which leads to the fact that a lot of this was being done by military occupation and how much that cost basically led to a lot of discontent and add that into the financial corruption of Grant's cabinet, and Reconstruction starts not being as popular. 
And around this time, some of the first people to actually put their spin on the Civil War were Southern generals selling their memoirs, Southern politicians trying to reframe the the Civil War and what Reconstruction is doing to them, and and Southern journalists who were sympathetic. And alongside that, you you have the Dars of the Confederacy, all these people trying to put a spin of the Civil War being more genteel, more about states' rights, not slavery, even though their very vice president basically said this was about the peculiar institution of slavery. So... So basically, in order to try to reframe this, especially after people realized ending slavery wasn't going to lead to a Haitian-style slave revolt, uh, in fact, a lot of figures like Du Bois and other people who would come after the immediate generation after Reconstruction wanted to reframe their emancipation as economic emancipation, labor emancipation, where a lot of them did want to prove that they were equals through employment. Unfortunately, by the time they did that, the industrial layer part of the American Industrial Revolution happened and labor relations changed. So, so, this reframing of the Reconstruction as lost cause basically happened immediately after the Civil War. As we entered, as you enter the Progressive Era, it got redefined as basically a war of economics, basically reframing most progressive interpretations of everything is basically trying to reframe it as an economic point of view. So it was basically a war of economics and views of monetary and physical, micro and macro economics. Basically making the issue of slavery, while important, more of a secondary concern. Again, kind of ignoring what a lot of Southern politicians blatantly said that this was about the peculiar institution of slavery and the fact that in their view of economics, they, the fact that a lot of the economic power of the Southern cotton agriculture was slave-based, again, kind of miss, misses the point. What truly redefined our view of Reconstruction history was Eric Fawner's short history of Reconstruction. Eric Fawner is probably one of the most important historians that we still have today. Eric Fawner's short history of Reconstruction reframes Reconstruction as America's unfinished revolution. He points out that, especially as the amount of freedmen in the South who got elected into Congress, especially in South Carolina, as proof that Reconstruction was working, a lot of freedmen who, in a lot of cases, were slaves or children of slaves, had an actual chance of making their voice heard. A lot of them were elected into important state positions. A lot of them had a chance to rewrite their state's constitutions. A lot of them had actually went back and bought their the plantations that they were slaves on. A lot of them had ability to buy farms or start businesses. A lot of them had the freedom to marry, which they didn't have before the Civil War in a lot of cases. A lot of them had the freedom to 
marry, divorce, and start families or even try to reconnect with the families that got separated by the plantation system. Gert Fauner basically set the tone of Reconstruction into modern-day revisionism and even post-revisionists. Even the post-revisionists are, because of how important he was, how excellent he was, how much he redefined Reconstruction history, he basically is a monolith, a living monolith. So, he reframes Reconstruction and reframes it from a political history point of view. And he points, and, and he probably has like the most traditional timeline of what, of Reconstruction beginning at 1863, and ending with a, with a compromise that put Hayes into the White House. Now, and with Vonner reframing Reconstruction as America's unfinished revolution, the next person that I would recommend that has a very important military point of view would be After Ap Appomattox by Downs. He compares the military occupation of the South in the light of recent military occupations in the Middle East. And kind of puts into terms how this really was civil rights informed at gunpoint. He's not making that sound bad or good. He's just saying the actual enforcement of civil rights during Reconstruction was most prominent in areas of military occupation and actual military presence in the South. And kind of reflects Form, reframes it as the congressional versus president's war powers where Congress, because of Johnson, took on a lot more of the more traditional war powers and even says that Reconstruction was proof that Appomattox wasn't a peace treaty, it was a ceasefire. Even ending the Civil War in Texas wasn't a firm peace treaty. Reconstruction, in a lot of ways, was, from Downs' point of view, was a continuation of the Civil War. And, and it wasn't until Reconstruction and the withdrawing of troops ended that we can argue very firmly that that the Civil War was over and and yeah, it's basically he really does try to paint it in the light of of that this that Reconstruction was a continuation and tries to kind of use the recent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq as kind of like good comparison points of like how how big of army needs to be to successfully occupy and where and how expensive that gets. The next book I really would recommend is is A Nation Under Our Feet. Now, A Nation Under Our Feet was written by was 
ran by Stephen Hawk. Now, now he tries to portray his book in the light of African American political power over the six decades and kind of grouping it with the Great Migration period of African Americans out of the South. Now, now, I really do want people to read these books because, especially with how many people kind of get confused about where, what America is, especially as we enter into another contentious election season, we need to kind of remind ourselves what the Civil War and Reconstruction was and where that kind of leaves us. Because if we don't actually learn about why these events happen, their consequences, and where we go from here, what does that really leave us? Because, because if we don't know where we live, how we got here, then it's hard to really argue whether or not we're a nation of people who blindly love their country or a nation who loves their country but asks for something better. So... I'm going to leave it there. Sorry if this is a depressing episode, but it's an important episode. And thanks for listening.